Welcome everybody to our first le online lecture in microbiology. We'll be talking about chapter 13, which is very fittingly on viruses, also viroids and prions at the very end, but the bulk of this lecture will be on viruses. So let's first think about what viruses are. Um, they're too small to be seen with a light microscope, so you need something better than a light microscope. A electron microscope will do it. Uh, there's also other ways where you can demonstrate the presence of viruses indirectly. So let's first take a look at um, uh, some of the characteristics of viruses. Viruses are known to be obligatory intracellular parasites. That means they require a living host cell to multiply. Um, there's a long-standing question whether viruses can be classified as life or not. Um, that question will probably be never be fully answered because life is defined as self-replicating units uh, known as cells. Viruses can't do that. They have to hijack a host cell in order to multiply. On the other hand, we all know that viruses can be alive and they can be dead. And um, in that sense, well, if you can kill it, uh, it must have been alive before. But so there's sort of on the interface between actual life, living things and what we would consider non-living things. But they definitely can hijack our cells and um, or many different types of cells and um, then use the host cell mechanisms to make more viruses. A virus is defined as a particle that contains some sort of a genetic material. There could be DNA or RNA, and then the genetic material is wrapped uh, in a coat, a protein coat, and um, they themselves, they do not contain ribosomes, and they have no ATP generating mechanism. That means they must rely entirely on all of the goods in the host cell in order to make more viruses. So what you see on this slide right here is um, a comparison between viruses and bacteria where those bacteria that are also obligatory intracellular parasites such as rickettsias and chlamydias listed in between. So we have the viruses on one side as extreme and then we have typical bacteria on the other side right here. So that would be a typical bacteria versus viruses and um, in between um, bacteria that require a host cell. So they also hijack other cells and live inside of other host cells. Those are in between right here. A um, couple of things to look at uh, would be sort of comparing the way these, um, these different types of infectious particles can um, generate energy, uh, how they divide. Um, so of course, uh, with bacteria, you have binary fission. Uh, that applies to both uh, the typical bacteria and the Rickettsias chlamydias, and then the viruses, of course, they have to inject their genetic material into a host cell to replicate themselves. Um, one characteristic about virus is their size, and uh, here the feature whether something can pass through a bacteriological filter is known to distinguish basically particles by their size. Viruses can pass through bacteriological filters. That means they are way too small to be held back by any type of uh, biological membrane that we can think of. Um, the genetic material, of course, um, is present in both bacteria and viruses and um, sensitivity to antibiotics to point this out right here. Um, antibiotics will only work against bacteria. There's no way um, an antibiotic will work against viruses and therefore should never be prescribed for somebody that has a viral infection. Uh, interferon is a substance that cells use to defend themselves or guard themselves um, uh, from viral entry and so therefore interferons once held a very large promise that maybe that would be the cure for viral infections but it turned out wasn't so much. So the host range is the spectrum of host cells a virus can infect. Um, viruses can pretty much infect any cell. Um, whether that be another bacterium or um, it could be a eukaryotic cell. Uh, so bacteriophages are those viruses that infect bacteria. 
And uh, as far as size is concerned, um, the range is from really, really small, 20 nanometers, to all the way up to 1,000 nanometers. That would be one micrometer. That's a very large virus. But the host range is very large, um, and um, viruses can infect certain viruses. So each each um, viral species sort of has its own host range of what they can infect. And if you talk about bacteriophages, those are viruses that infect bacteria. And then each virus has typically its preferred species of uh, eukaryotic cells if they in fact either infect plant cells or um, animal cells. Let's take a look at viral sizes. So here, very small type of virus I would be here, this um, bacteriophage MS2, 24 nanometers, and your poliovirus, 30 nanometers, still pretty small. Um, adenoviruses, those are your typical, rhinoviruses, adenoviruses are typically um, cold viruses, and then a rabies virus, that one looks interesting, looks like a bullet. And then um, we will be talking later about prions. These are infectious protein particles, so they're different from viruses. But here, typical bacteriophage. So this one is much larger, um, 225 nanometers. Compare that, um, it's like almost 10 times the size of these bacteriophages right here, the really tiny ones. And so some other ones here. This one looks like a box, um, vaccinia virus. And then the Ebola virus looks like a candy cane, sort of an evil candy cane, very large virus right here. In comparison, here's an E. coli bacterium, the size. And then here you have a human red blood cell uh, down here, which looks ginormous compared to a virus particle. Um, the viral structure. Um, so the virion, that will be complete, fully developed viral particle, that's what we call virion then, which contains nucleic acid, which could be either DNA or RNA, that can be either single-stranded or double-stranded, uh, linear or circular, and we will see the differences when we classify the viruses. Um, capsid is the protein coat made of capsomeres, which are the subunits that are making up the capsid, so the complete protein coat. Um, many viruses also have what's called an envelope uh, that could be um, a phospholipid bilayer with embedded proteins and carbohydrates um, that are decoding on some viruses. Uh, typically, if a virus has an envelope, that's what your immune system will recognize because um, there are proteins and carbohydrate residuals st sticking up from that envelope, and that's usually what your immune system will spot and then make antibodies against that. Um, so these uh, protein or carbohydrate um, spike proteins and um, car uh, carbohydrate containing proteins, uh, these spike projections, um, that's what they're called, spike proteins, for example. So when you have some virus with spike proteins, that will be the proteins that are sticking up from the envelope of the virus. So here, one more time for the nomenclature, the capsid would be the entire um, coat right here. And the capsomere, those are the subunits um, that making up the coat of this virus. This one is polyhedral, and we call something polyhedral when it has many sides to it. Under the um, under the, micro, the electron microscope, that will be something, would look something like this, a non-envelope polyhedral virus with many sides. And here we have the morphology of an enveloped virus. So there you have the nucleic acid in the center. You can see that right here. That's in purple. And then uh, we have the capsomere, so that coat uh, that's um, sort of surrounding the nucleic acid material. And then here, in this case, we have an envelope, an envelope virus that has in green those uh, spike proteins sticking up from the envelope. And again, this would be what your immune system will recognize and make antibodies against this, uh, these spike proteins. In the electron micrograph, these viruses, an envelope virus, might look something like this, what you have down here. So now uh, we took a look at the um, 
um, polyhedral viruses and envelope viruses. Now what's been missing is um, helical viruses and complex viruses. So let's take first a look at helical viruses, what they might look like. Here you have an Ebola virus. Um, so the transmission electron micrograph down here shows um, it shows an Ebola virus. And um, what you see in a helical virus, the typical thing is that you have the uh, nucleic acid material kind of looks like a spiral um, that uh, like a spring that's inside um, and then wrapped by the capsid as usual and the capsomeres again those are the little subunits that are making up the capsid um, an example for helical virus would be this Ebola down here where you have inside spiral the um, the genetic material and then wrapped um, with the capsid and let's move on to take a look. So here is the bacteriophage. Um, this is the morphology of a complex virus. And as you can see here, we have the, um, a head structure. So the, the capsid would be the head structure right here. Then we have a neck portion or sheath. And then the tail fibers right here that are used to, um, for the virus to attach to a surface. You can see them right here lining up on the surface of a bacterium. They always kind of remind me to a little space shuttle landing on the surface of some sort of a planet. Anyway, um, whichever way you want to imagine this, but here would be the genetic material inside of the head structure, structure and that will be released into the interior of the bacterium uh, go, going through the neck right here, so the neck portion right here, and then injecting the genetic material only into the bacterial cell in this case. Next, we're going to take a look at the taxonomy of viruses. It's um, a little bit more difficult to define species and then name these species um, and sort them together with um, families and orders and um, all of the things that we normally do for, let's say, animals. Uh, viruses, um, it's all by genetic material, basically, and by the a niche that they occupy, sort of the ecological niche. But nevertheless, so you can group viruses and give them a genus name that will be ending in virus. And um, everybody's talking about this one in particular, so let's use it as an example, coronavirus. That's a virus, a genus name. <clears throat> it, uh, the coronavirus belongs to a family of coronaviridae. So the family names end in viridae. And then um, up from there will be the orders. Um, in this case, we are talking about the Nido viralis. Uh, so orders of viruses, they end in alis. And um, so technically, a viral species is defined as a group of viruses sharing the same genetic information and ecological niche, i.e. the host that they infect. And um, you can also use sometimes descriptive common names for certain species and uh, sometimes uh, uh, viruses have subspecies that are then listed by numbers. Uh, for example, herpes simplex virus type 1 or type 2 and so forth. So let's take a look real quick at the example of the coronavirus. The taxonomy here would be the order was the Nido viralis, the family is the coronaviridae. This one has a subfamily of coronavirinae, and then the genus here, there's different subtypes in the genus. The one that's causing the problem right now is the beta coronavirus, and there were some other ones previously that caused problems, like the SARS coronavirus, the MERS coronavirus, and right now we're dealing with the COVID-19. So now let's take a look at um, how we could grow viruses. Uh, so we already know that they must be grown in living cells. Uh, the easiest example here to take a look at how we could grow viruses would be to take a bacteriophage. Now bacteriophages, they must be grown in bacteria. And when they grow in bacteria, they eventually fill up the bacterial cell with all those new viruses and they will burst out of those bacteria and thereby destroying the bacterial cell. So when you're growing bacteria as a lawn on a petri plate and then you are infecting these bacteria with um, viruses, what you will see is plaques, zones of clearing that um, come about from these destroyed um, bacterial cells that uh, now don't exist anymore. And a virus that is able to do such a thing is called a plaque-forming unit, a PFU.
And here real quick, this is what a plaque would look like on a lawn of bacteria.